honor and privilege. Uh, they don't need any introduction. But, uh, you know, looking back over 20 years, 20 plus years, be safe to say that, uh, we've had the privilege of being around a lot of young folks. And I'm looking across this room today, and I see Brianna back there. I get you and your sister, so it's Brianna, right? Okay. See, Creole girls don't feel so bad. All right. Uh, I'm looking around, and I see all these young folks that, uh, that are here today. Uh, I see Jacob back over there that uh, we worked with at, uh, at Oak Grove, and I see, Ch see Seth back there, over here somewhere, Seth. Uh, I, I see him back there that I can remember he was up here leading music. I see Nathan. Uh, he was in our uh, Keepers of the Faith class. And I see Brianna that's, uh, you know, that was part of that. Uh, I see Ch Channing Taylor that's here with us today. Uh, they were younger than my kids. I'm not so sure if that's supposed to make me feel old or proud. I'm going with the latter, and I'm going to feel proud. Uh, with the world that we live in today, we think, are we doing any good? Are we, are we doing, uh, is God still calling young people? Is young people still concerned about church? They sure are. Look around our church today, and I'm sure you all can say the same thing. God's still touching young people's hearts. Young people are still concerned about, and that's just a few. I know that there's several others here today, but that's just a few that I pulled out today, and I'm grateful for that. But Brother J.D., at this time, would you like to come forward? Uh, just to give you, a, and I may steal some thunder here, but I'm so excited about this. Uh, our, our, the new couple that we've been having, and they're not new anymore. They're, they've been among us and are about us. But the cranks uh, have had a big influence on Brother J.D.'s life. See how God's work all put, comes together. Uh, they, they can remember when Brother J.D. was saved in Vacation Bible School. Is that right? See, isn't that how wonderful how all of it just kind of fits up? And, and, and it started out in a church around Mansfield. And now it's went to Brazil. Isn't that, that's how God's work does. And that encourages me. That really does. Brother J.D., I won't take any more of your time. Just take your time and let the Lord lead, okay? Boy, look at this little fellow right here. And then this watermelon right here. My goodness. Well, good morning, everyone. We are so thrilled to be here with you this morning. Um, before Noah uh, starts fussing because he's getting sleepy, and Emma's dying to go over to Children's Church. We wanted to bring the family up here and introduce them to you. Um, and so this is Noah William, four months old, five months old. You're getting big on me, buddy. Can you smile for everybody? But, and then, then this is Emma Rose, um, and she is going to, uh, if cooperates, uh, say a verse for you. What's your name? Emma Rose. That's right. Emma is two, and on Wednesday nights in Brazil, we've been learning about the book of Genesis and walking through the patriarchs. So as she's learned about the life of Abraham, she learned a verse that I hope that she'll say for you this morning. So Hebrews 11, 6, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. You ready? Sem fé. Sem fé. É impossível agradar a Deus. At this time, Brother Keith, you can show that video and then I'll be back up to preach after our video. I can't even speak your brilliance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's great. Hi, we're JD and Brianna Webb, and three years ago we moved to Minas Gerais, Brazil for our first term as missionaries. And during this time, our main task has been learning the Portuguese language while acclimating to the culture and living on the mission field. And God has blessed in a tremendous way. And although I don't feel fluent yet, I do feel like I've made great progress. And the Lord during this time has given us two beautiful children. What's your name? Emma Rose. How old are you? I'm Billy. You're two? Mm -hmm. Wow. Emma, where do you live? Rangina. Where? Rangina. Yeah. What? Do you have a baby brother? What's his name? Baby Say it louder. Baby Ola. Oh, baby Noah. 
Do you love him? <laughs> we were out in town a few weeks ago and there is over 140,000 people in our city. People going back and forth downtown, walking and cars everywhere and motorcycles. And Emma was looking around and said, mommy, so many people. And I was able to remind her that yes, Emma, there's so many people here and they all need Jesus. They need to know that Jesus loves them. And so her and her two-year-old little mind said, oh, they need Jesus. And she started screaming, Jesus loves you! Jesus loves you! <laughs> we have learned that one of the most effective tools in ministry is through building relationships. And we have really enjoyed getting to know people in our church and building those relationships and also people who need Christ out in town. Um, we love our church family so much and it's just given us a unique opportunity to be able to minister while JD has been learning the language, but also to be ministered to. And we have built so many relationships and friendships here that we feel like will last a lifetime. And recently Hope Church has brought me on as the missions pastor, as well as the vice president of the recently constructed Christian school. Uh, this means that Brianna and I will have an active part in raising up the next generation to make an impact here in Brazil for the cause of Christ. And as the missions pastor of the church, uh, I have been tasked with uh, a job of surveying the surrounding region, a, a region of 1.3 million people, uh, to see where we can plant the next Bible-believing church and then assist our pastor, Pastor David Acock, in cultivating an atmosphere within Hope Church that will assist in raising up workers and then training them for the ministry. We've recently had two young families that have shown interest and have committed to pray about joining our team about building churches when that time comes. Um, and would you please pray for them? We are beyond excited about the doors of opportunity that God has been opening for our family here in Brazil. And of course, our ministry here would be impossible without people like you. And so if you've been one of our partners for these past three years, we just wanted to say from the bottom of our hearts, thank you very much for partnering with us. And if you've not yet partnered with us and you feel led to do so, uh, we ask that you will prayerfully consider contributing monthly or just praying for us. I, what we are doing would be impossible without the prayers and supports of people like you. So thank you very much. Thank you. Obrigada. Tata. You got kisses? Where did I? I set my Bible down here. Excuse me. It is much easier traveling with young ones that make you look a lot cuter. And uh, so we, we are so grateful. For those of you who do not know, uh, Brianna and I tried for years to be able to have children while we were in America. And it just never happened. Get to Brazil and there's something in the water. And uh, so we've had two. Um, my brother-in-law... Uh, Hot Rod, as most of you know him by, Rodney Blackwell, and uh, his wife, Autumn, who Pastor Tim gets confused with my wife. Uh, it's okay if you get confused, but if I get confused, we're going to be in trouble. <laughs> and, um, and so they, are, uh, they have two already, and then they're pregnant with twins. And so they're about to have four little girls. And so like I said, just something in the water in Brazil. Um, but we are grateful for our family and how God has blessed. And it is so good to be here with you this morning. I have so many dear friends in this church. Um, I, I've told Pastor Tim over and over that if there's a church that would bring me back uh, uh, in America that I'd be consider, it'd be Limestone. Uh, and so if y'all ever need a youth pastor, feel free to call. No, I'm, I'm teasing. We're exactly where God wants us. And that's evidence with our two little kids. Um, and so we know where we're uh, supposed to be, but we love this place. Uh, our Sunday school lesson this morning, I'm not sure about the sanctuary, but down below, um, 
Uh, we were talking about 1 John chapter number 4 and how if we are uh, professing to be Christians, then uh, the way that the world knows that we belong to Christ is our love for one another. And this church has definitely been an example of that to me and my family. Uh, even when I was just dating Brianna and coming here for Thanksgiving from Southeastern uh, and spending Thanksgiving holiday with her uh, and with her grandmom, uh, y'all have always been so loving and accommodating to me uh, and now to our entire family, and we are so grateful for that. It is good to see Brother Dave and Miss Pam. Uh, they, uh, Brother Dave, or Brother uh, Pastor Tim, it goes back even further than you're aware of. Uh, and so, yes, they were. Uh, they put on some awesome vacation Bible schools when we were uh, in Mansfield, Ohio, together. And I, I was a bus kid. I did not grow up in church. And uh, I, as I rode that bus to church, uh, that Thursday night of one of the vacation Bible schools, I gave my heart and life over to Jesus Christ. Um, then come to find out later that Brother Dave and Miss Pam, I, when they were young, uh, my age uh, or roundabout, uh, they moved into a house right across the street from my dad. And so they actually watched my dad grow up. Uh, and so that, that's pretty neat, the connections that uh, have been there. And uh, thank you all for your love and uh, pouring into me. I, I would not be able to be in Brazil if it were not for you two. And so thank you so much. Uh, and look forward to catching up with them a little bit after church uh, uh, and uh, while we're here in Tennessee, maybe. Uh, I want to invite you to take your Bibles and turn in them to the book of Romans, chapter number 10. And Pastor Tim, did, did the young men pass these cards out? Okay. Yes, please. Um, thank you. And while they're taking care of that, um, I'm going to explain our prayer card to you as they are passing them out, and you'll get those in just a moment. Um, but it, it's a little bit different. It's uh, perforated down the middle. And so half of the card that you're going to receive is our prayer card. And so we want you to take that, tear it off, put it in your fridge, stick it in your Bible, somewhere where you will remember to pray for us. Uh, and then there's information on the back. If you feel led to uh, support us on a monthly basis, we would welcome that support. Um, and there's information on there uh, of how you can give to us. Uh, you can mail it to the church. We have a website at the church that you can give through. Uh, Pastor Tim mentioned this morning that uh, even if you go to your church's website and you can give through there and just note that it is for the web account and they'll make sure that it gets to us. I'm sure you can put it in your church offering place several ways. Uh, that y'all can give and you all have been some of our best supporters uh, a lot of individual support through this church and so we are so grateful and thankful for that um, but if you feel led to uh, support us and you have not and there uh, the other part of that uh, card is a connection card uh, and if you can fill that out and just commit uh, one of the following, I'll pray for you. Uh, I'd like to receive updates and newsletters. Uh, and then if the Lord lays on your heart to support us, there's a place for that. And if you can just fill that out, even if you're not given to us monthly and you just like to receive our newsletter and keep uh, uh, up with what we are doing in Brazil, we would be glad to mail that to you. Uh, but we need your information. And so your name, address, so on and so forth. And we will be glad to get you set up for that. Uh, Romans chapter number 10 is where we're going to be this morning, and so I want to invite you to stand to your feet as we pay reverence to the Word of God. Uh, Romans chapter number 10, and we're going to read verses 11 through 17. Romans chapter number 10, verses 11 through 17, the Bible says, For the Scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon Him. And then the key, one of the key verses that we hold to as Christians, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But then we're presented with some questions that Paul gives us. How then? If whosoever calls upon the Lord shall be saved, how then? Shall they call on Him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in Him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they 
have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing. And hearing by what? The Word of God. Our Father, we ask that You add Your blessing to the reading of Your Word this morning. I pray that You will use me as Your messenger to declare uh, Your Word with boldness, uh, with clarity. That God, speak to hearts this morning as only You can. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for standing. You may be seated. Uh, three years ago, Brianna and I moved to Brazil with a desire to do something big for our God. Now, we did not know everything that this would entail, but we knew one thing. Missions is the heartbeat of a holy and righteous God. And if that is true, and I believe that Scriptures teach us that it is, then we must understand what missions is. And so what is missions? When we speak about missions, what are we referring to? We are referring to local churches being obedient to the command of the Lord and taking the Gospel throughout the world. Reaching people of every race, of every language group, and establishing local churches that will produce believers who will repeat the process and also spreading the Gospel. That is what missions is. It is local churches like this one taking the Gospel to the ends of the world. And if that is our mission, then we must understand what is the Gospel. The Gospel is the teaching that man is a sinner. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It is the teaching that the Lord Jesus Christ is God's holy Son who gave Himself as a propitiation for the remission of sins for the entire world. He rose again victoriously from the dead and He offers the gift of eternal life freely to every sinner who will call upon Him and receive Him as Savior. That is the Gospel. In short, missions can be summarized as those who have been saved by the Gospel. Sharing the Gospel with those who have never heard the Gospel. As I mentioned, this is the heartbeat of our Savior. He came to seek and to save that which is lost. And because it is our Savior's heartbeat, Brianna and I, our family has sought to make it our heartbeat as well. So three years ago, we moved to Brazil to fulfill God's plan for our lives. Now, my goal, just being honest with you, is that one day Brazil will no longer need missionaries. Uh, it is my prayer that one day Brazil will be reached with the Gospel of Christ and so much that Brazilians will be able to carry forth the Gospel and reach their own uh, with, uh, with the Gospel for Jesus Christ. Uh, now that may never happen in our lifetime, but that is my heart's desire. That Brazil will one day be considered a Christian nation. To make steps in that direction in reaching Brazil for Christ, a few months ago, our church there, Igreja Batista Livre Esperança, or Hope Free Will Baptist Church, uh, voted to bring me on staff as their missions pastor. We mentioned that in the video. Uh, but I want to share with you what that means. It means that they have tasked me with the job of uh, raising up people within the church who will have a desire, a burden, to carry the Gospel to their own. Uh, and to see young men answer the call to preach, to see young women surrender their lives to the call of ministry, and go out and reach their own for the Gospel of Jesus Christ. And then they have tasked me with the job of surveying our area, as we mentioned, an area of 1.3 million people. Uh, very few Bible-believing churches, even fewer Free Will Baptist churches, uh, but survey that area and plant more Bible-believing, gospel-centered, uh, Holy Ghost fire preaching churches. It's what they need. It's what we all need. And so we have been tasked with that. Uh, as I've, uh, I, I feel uh, completely unqualified for the job. But I do understand that God has uniquely qualified my family for the job. Uh, it's no accident that I married a Brazilian. It's no accident that her family, uh, three generations now serving the Lord faithfully in Brazil, God has equipped our family uh, for the job that is hand. And so we're very excited about the doors of opportunity that God is opening for our future ministry. 
Missions is the heartbeat of our God. Uh, This truth is seen throughout Scripture. Isaiah says, Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none else. 1 Timothy chapter 2, A God will have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. 2 Peter, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness. He is long-suffering toward usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. One author appropriately said, The mission of the church is missions. The mission of the church is missions. But this leads us to the text that we have read together this morning. I think we can all agree that God desires to see all men saved. Amen? That's God's desire. So that leads us to the question of how. If God desires that all men be saved, how does He plan on accomplishing that task? Through us. Through us. I've often wondered why, I'll be honest with you, I may have gotten saved a whole lot earlier and I have family that I have no doubt would be saved. If God would just split the sky open, peek down and say, be saved, judgment is coming. Don't you think that they'd, okay God, they're looking for a sign, what better sign? But that's not the way God has chosen to reach the world. He's chosen to reach it through us. I'm through sinners who have been saved, reaching other sinners who need to be saved. Paul, who had been miraculously saved and surrendered his life to reaching others with the Gospel, reached a point in his ministry where he realized that the job at hand required more workers. He knew that God desired to save all men. But as he looked around the church of his day, he realized there were not enough workers for the job. Romans chapter 10 Uh, is where we see that. And I want us to see how that applies to us today. Uh, This is a passage that God has used to reinforce His calling upon my life several times. And it's a passage that I hope God will use to stir up something in you. Because every once in a while, we need stirred up. We need to be provoked with the things of Christ. And so it's my prayer and desire that God will do that, not because of me, but because of His Word and through His Word this morning. The first thing that I see in this passage is an inescapable pressure that Paul had. An inescapable pressure. Look with me at Romans chapter 10, verse number 1. Romans chapter 10, verse number 1. Paul says, Brethren, My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Paul was not just saying this to sound spiritual. Paul had a burning desire within his bones to see the Jewish, his Jewish kinsmen, those who were of the same lineage as he was, to be saved. Paul showed his heart in the depth of his concern when he said, I say the truth in Christ and I lie not. My conscience also bears witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart for I would wish myself accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. You know what Paul is saying there? He's saying, I have such a desire to see people saved that I would wish a judgment in eternity in a place called hell if it meant that I could win them to Jesus Christ. An inescapable pressure. I want to ask you, what kind of pressure do we have in seeing people saved? Uh, Paul was willing uh, to go to hell on their behalf. Are you willing to walk across the street? Paul was willing to spend an eternity separated from Christ. Are we willing to open our mouth and talk to a co-worker? you got to understand, I'm this thing that God has called all men to, and we'll look at that in just a minute, it is an inescapable pressure. A pressure that, uh, that people need to know Christ. A reality that uh, an eternity is awaiting them. Apart from Christ, Paul had a holy and burning desire for the salvation of his own people, the Jews. He was a Jew at heart. By his own testimony, he was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He understood the heart of the typical Jew that was steeped in Mosaic tradition and legalism. He knew how blinded they were in that day. 
That same desire that he had for the Jews was the same desire that God placed in him to reach the Gentiles, to reach us with the Gospel. Thank God for the Apostle Paul. If it were not for Paul, the Gospel would not have been carried to us, those who are not Jewish. At Ephesus he wrote, Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years, he's writing to Gentiles here, that for the space of three years I cease not to warn every one of you night and day with tears. His heart was broken that people were going to spend an eternity apart from Christ. At Corinth he declared, For though I preach the Gospel, I have nothing to glory of. Necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe unto me if I preach not the Gospel. In his second letter to the Corinthians, he said, The love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if Christ died for all, then all are dead. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have not imparted unto you uh, the gospel of God only, but also our own souls. Paul said, I'm not only sharing the word of God, I'm giving my life for you. I'm working myself into an early grave for you because you were dear to us. For you remember, brethren, our labor and our travail, for laboring night and day because we would not be chargeable unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. Paul had an inescapable pressure. He felt like the weight of the world was placed upon his shoulders because he knew that uh, if men were to die without Christ, they'd spend an eternity in a place called hell. Hell is real, folks. And people are really dying every day and going there. And God has tasked us to reach them. To go to the highways and the hedges to compel them to come in that His house might be full. So Paul committed his life to make sure that everyone he came in contact with knew about Jesus Christ. Missions is an inescapable pressure. A pressure that drives a man day and night, night and day, to win people to Jesus Christ. I want to ask you this morning, is there a burning desire within your bones to make sure that the Gospel is spread? If so, I submit to you this morning that God may be calling you to something more. God may be calling you and calling for your life to be used to do something great, something more. Because the next thing that I see in this passage is not only an inescapable pressure that Paul had, but there's an inexcusable problem. An inexcusable problem. That's the second thing we see in this passage. Paul exclaimed the richness of salvation. Look at verse number 13 again. I, one of the keystone verses for us as Christians. For whosoever... How many of you are a whosoever this morning? Aren't you glad for that? For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Paul exclaimed the richness of salvation. This salvation knows no boundaries. It is a salvation that is free to all who will call upon the name of the Lord. But Paul was aware of a problem. That being not everyone has heard of Christ and the salvation that He freely offers. And so Paul presents the problem at hand with four questions that I want to share with you this morning. Four simple but very thought-provoking questions. They're found in verses 14 and 15. And uh, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on Him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in Him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? The four questions that are presented in this passage of Scripture, how shall they call in Him of whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in Him of whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach except they be sent? These are valid questions. Uh, and questions that need to be answered. These questions present the crux of the problem that Paul observed in his day. And I'll tell you, it's a problem that we still have in our day. It's an inexcusable problem. I want us to answer those four questions together. Out loud, how 
can they, how can the lost call on Jesus in whom they have not believed? How can they call on Him of whom they have not believed? How? They can't. If someone doesn't know who Jesus is, it's impossible for them to call on Him. How can they believe in Jesus if they have not heard about Jesus? They can't. How can they hear if there's not a preacher, if there's not someone telling them? They can't. And how can they preach except they be sent? They can't. Our world population today is quickly approaching 8 billion people. Of that 8 billion people, nearly 40% has never heard the name of Jesus Christ even one time. Uh, Of that 8 billion people, it's estimated that only 1.2 billion has trusted Christ as their personal Savior. Uh, This means that if Jesus were to return right now, and we believe He could return at any moment, amen? If Jesus were to return right now, 6.8 billion people would spend an eternity in a place called hell. Oswald Smith said, we talk of the second coming of Christ, but half the world has never heard of the first. This is an inexcusable problem. In over 2,000 years, the church has yet to reach 40% of the population even one time with the gospel of Jesus Christ. How many of you have ever heard of Coca-Cola? Of course you have. I love Coca-Cola. You can tell by looking at me that I'm an avid drinker. I support that company. Uh, We've all heard of Coca-Cola. It's the number one brand in the entire world. I will say I like Diet Mountain Dew better, but... Um, Coca-Cola, I'm the number one brand in all the world, but I found this very interesting, Pastor Tim. They did not start their global distribution until 1970, just 52 years ago. Uh, but it's estimated today that 97% of the world has heard of Coca-Cola. Y'all know where I'm going with this, right? In 52 years... A pop company or soda, is it pop or soda here? Soda pop? A soda pop company has done more with its product than the church has done in 2,000 years. Which group of people do you think love their product more? A pop company or born again believers who have been spared from an eternity in hell? Y'all understand this is an inexcusable problem that we're facing today. 2 Corinthians tells us if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. The church has been given a mandate. And that mandate is found in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Not just America. Not not just the United States. uh, But to teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. To be sure that we understand that this is our mandate given to us by God Himself. He gave it to us four more times in Mark chapter 16, in Luke chapter 24, in John chapter 20, and in the book of Acts chapter number 1 verse number 8. God has made it abundantly clear that we as believers are to saturate this world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are to plant churches. We are to win souls. We are to disciple. We are to bring them into the church. We are to see them baptized. And we are to reproduce the process. It's an infallible mandate. It is a compassionate mandate. What uh, what better way to share the love of Christ than showing Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world? It's a compassionate mandate, but I submit to you this morning, it's an unfulfilled mandate. There is still work to be done. 6.8 billion people need to be saved. How is He going to reach them? God tells us, you know, uh, my, my very first pastor told me that when I answered the call to preach, that you've been called to preach. That means that if you were to become President of the United States, you'd be settling. What he means is that that's the highest calling that God places on a life. And I believe that. Uh, But it's very interesting, just so us preachers don't get so high on ourselves and think more of ourselves than we ought to, you know what what God calls preaching? 
foolishness. For God has chosen the foolishness of preaching to save them which believe. Uh, So how is God going to save the world? Through the foolishness of preaching. Uh, Preaching is simply proclaiming the Word of God. And that's not just referring to me and Pastor Tim and if there's any other Brother Reese. Uh, It's not just referring to us uh, who God has called in that way. It's, it's, It's all of us. All of us are called to be witnesses of what we've experienced in Christ. But Paul asks us today, how shall they believe on Him in whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without a preacher? They can't. They can't. The problem that we are facing today is a shortage of workers. Uh, That's true in the United States too, isn't it? Uh, Brazil needs workers in reaching people for Christ. The United States needs workers in reaching people for Christ. Uh, You know, Chick-fil-A needs workers. I saw a sign in Greenville, $14 an hour. I'd have loved to work fast food making $14 an hour. Uh, when I started at McDonald's, it was five twenty-five an hour. And some of you probably remember when... I, I, I won't go there. Uh, but <laughs> there's a shortage of workers all around. The Bible tells us the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. I have no doubt that most of you agree with what I'm saying. Uh, most of you agree with everything that I've said. How many of you agree that God wants to save all men? Uh, I hope you believe that. How many of you believe that God wants to use us to see it done? Amen. How many of you believe that there's a problem, though, at hand, that more people need to be reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ? We all agree with those things that I have said. But maybe you're here this morning, you're thinking, that's all great, Brother J.D., but I've not been called. I want you to listen to the words of William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army. He says, put your ear to the Bible. And hear him bid you go to pull sinners out of the fire of sin. Put your ear to the burdened, agonized heart of humanity and listen to its pitiful wail for help. Go stand by the gates of hell and hear the...